We're coming now to, I think, one of the real uh, highlights of this program. We're actually going to hear from uh, young people uh, uh, who we've been talking about <laughs> at this whole conference. The idea for this panel is we wanted to feature four different pathway uh, programs that are really producing some incredible results. Uh, FFA, uh, which has over 500,000 members, um, largely in uh, rural America. Uh, we've got the national president from FFA, FFA here. Uh, Year Up, we heard from Gerald Shurtavian last night. Youth Build, we heard from Dorothy Stoneman yesterday. And then we've got um, one of the Massachusetts <coughs> regional vocational high schools, Blackstone Valley, and um, Michael Fitzpatrick was one or, on one of our panels earlier today. And so moderating this session is uh, Mark Edwards, Executive Director of Opportunity Nation. As I think all of you know, Opportunity Nation is launching a national movement to really raise awareness um, of the uh, issue of opportunity youth and try to get the nation a lot more committed to meeting that challenge. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Edwards. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, thrilled to be here. Uh, you know, we started by hearing from Ron about the importance of starting a movement, and I don't know of a movement in this country that's been started without young people. And so we're thrilled to have them here today. I think this is very, very exciting. I spent 25 years in the uh, private sector uh, and came to understand firsthand just how important having opportunity was for uh, the chance for me to achieve my full potential. Um, as we heard in this conference, we have to find multiple pathways and multiple ways for young adults to, uh, to achieve all that they can. So the structure of our panel today is going to be pr really simple. Um, uh, I really want to feature young people. Uh, we're going to have uh, some of the program leaders give a very short overview. If you thought that the buzzer went off and that was enough to get people off the stage, if they go too long, I'm going to really pull them off the stage because this is really all about young people today. So I'm very, very excited. It's not a way. Well, I will be the buzzer then, so don't worry about that. All right. So, so uh, brief word on Opportunity Nation. We are a uh, national coalition of organizations. About 250 organizations have come together to promote opportunity and mobility in this country. We touch our, our organizations touch or work with about 100 million Americans. We have a tool called the Opportunity Index, which is a tool that actually measures opportunity at the community level. One of the indicators that comes together to create the Opportunity Index scores, and this we rank all 50 states and bundle all 2,900 counties into grades is an indicator that measures the percentage of 16 to 24 year olds who are neither in school nor in work. And that indicator, more than any other indicator in the Opportunity Index, we include things like the poverty rate, the unemployment rate, access to the internet, access to preschool, that indicator drives opportunity scores. We know that when young adults are connected, communities tend to do well, and when they're not, they don't do as well. And so as a campaign, we are focused on a set of legislative action to support young adults, as well as spurring private sector partnerships to do exactly the same thing. So this is very near and dear to our hearts, and we're thrilled to, uh, to be a part of this. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, our first adult leader, Dwight Armstrong, the CEO of uh, National FFA, um, to do a quick introduction, and then we'll quickly get to our, our young people. Thank you. Thanks, Dwight. Thanks, Mark. If I could have the first slide, please. First of all, how many former FFA members are in the room? Hold your hand up. Look around. Look around. See? And, and I especially want to introduce one, Paul Moya. Please stand up. Paul Moya is our... Four years ago, he was our national president from New Mexico. Since then, he's been through a finance degree at Notre Dame and now a graduate program here at Harvard. So glad to have him with us. <laughs> FFA started in 1928, originally as Future Farmers of America. Changed its name in 1988. Did I say 28? 1928 is when we started. 1988 is when we changed our name to, to offer a broader base of, of experiences to our young people that it's more than plows, cows, and sows. <laughs> we are very much still plows, cows, and uh, sows, and sows, plows, and cows, but we're also 300 different careers in agriculture, and we're working hard to make a positive difference in the lives of these young people, but we do it through agriculture education. We're not a club. We're an integral part of school-based ag education. We're one of the few chartered nonprofit organizations, I mean, we're one of the few chartered congressional chartered organizations out there. Uh, that doesn't mean we get federal money, because we don't, unless we're fortunate enough to get a grant from USDA or USDE. But we are administered through the Department of Education, and uh, we represent uh, young people all across the country. We're certainly trying to make a difference in the lives of those young people with, with our vision and our, and our mission. But the main thing I wanted to show you is a little bit of our scope. 
a little bit of our scope in that we're uh, about a million young people taking ag education classes today. Over 557,000 of those are in FFA, so there's room to grow. We're at our highest membership ever. Uh, 11,000 teachers, key part of what we're doing, those agriculture education teachers. In my life, I was a former FFA member. My ag teacher made all the difference in the world for me, and you can hear stories around the room the same way. So again, we represent all 50 uh, states plus our two, uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, uh, and we're located in about 7,400, almost 7,500 schools. The key thing I wanted to leave with you is we're an integral part of ag education, the three-circle model, what takes place in the classroom, what FFA does around leadership, career development, and, and, and premier uh, growth, uh, uh, personal growth in these young people. And the third component is this whole thing we've been talking about, experiential learning. It's been a part of our model and our mission for a long time. You can see a few of the attributes to the side that we try to talk about. I think many of those are in that 21st century skill list that you talk about and you look at. And the last thing I want to leave to you is never underestimate the value of bringing young people together to celebrate success. We have one of the largest youth organization conventions in the world. We had last year in Indianapolis, we had over 56,000 young people come to Indianapolis for a three to four day period to celebrate their success, say thanks to their teachers, to say thanks to their parents, and say thanks to the sponsors. It's my pleasure to introduce you our national FFA president, Clay Sapp, from Florida. Thank you so much, Dr. Armstrong, for that wonder wonderful introduction. As you see, it's a very large organization that really covers the, the scope of our country. But before we really get started today, I think on behalf of all of the young adults, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Simons, for bringing the young adults to the table. It really makes us feel valued. <laughs> And really, it, this week has just filled my cup. I mean, really rejuvenated me to only go further in depth in career and technical education and make sure. <laughs> What's the joke there? In depth. <laughs> further in depth. Um, on career, yeah, that's right. We've gone pretty deep this week. You're right. But to continue to get out there on the local level and ensure that this is a system that's sustained for years. I think systems approach is something that we've talked about a lot. Uh, these past couple of hours, but we want to make sure that we're continuing to create a system that is going to continue to turn out individuals who are ready for that career force, who are ready to go into that job and can be successful. And that's exactly what we try to do in agricultural education and the FFA organization. Today I represent the National FFA organization, which is the organization that Dr. Armstrong was speaking of, but the career pathway truly starts in the, in the classroom in the agricultural education classroom. And so today, I wish I could offer you the perfect solution to all of our issues here in correct, uh, career and technical education, and that I cannot. But I do hope to shed a positive light on what teachers are doing on the forefront, the front lines of career and technical education that truly is making a difference in the lives of students. And, it, and they are making sure that students are prepared for future careers. So today I'm just going to tell you three quick things that I experienced in my pathway that really allowed me to be successful and really engaged me in the learning of technical knowledge and skills, but also those soft skills uh, that we all need to obtain to be successful in that future career path. And so those three things are the classroom uh, career exploration, so really exploring careers in the classroom from the get-go right at the beginning of those courses, but also a supervised agricultural experience program, uh, which is what a lot of us have been talking about this week with work-based learning and experiential learning. And finally, uh, developing those 21st century skills, those soft skills that we're going to be able to use when we go into that future career path. And so it all starts out for me in the classroom. I was very fortunate and in a unique situation because my father was my agriculture instructor and my <laughs> FFA advisor. As many of you know, that can be a great thing and that can be a really bad thing at times. <laughs> Absolutely. But from the get-go, I can remember in my seventh grade agricultural education class because in Florida, we start exploring careers in the seventh grade, which has been a topic that we've talked about a little bit uh, this week as well. Uh, I really got introduced to the various careers in agriculture, and we like to refer to it in the agriculture pathway as the new ag-based economy. 
As Dr. Armstrong alluded to earlier, many of us have this perception that agriculture is just production agriculture. It's just out there in the fields, uh, plowing up the land, planting the crops, and that certainly is a large component of agriculture. But today, agriculture spans such a wider range than just the production side. It really goes into science with food science and uh, health and safety in making sure that our food that's going to our table is safe and is affordable for our families. And it also goes into making sure that we're creating varieties of crops that are going to continue to produce higher yields, that are going to make sure that we can feed that growing world population that is expected to be 9 billion by 2050. And agriculture and agricultural jobs play a large role in that. And so as soon as I entered that agricultural classroom in the seventh grade, I was confronted with this is the challenge that we face. And these are the careers that are afforded to you that can help us meet that challenge. And so from the beginning, I believe Ms. Pennington, it was earlier yesterday that said, we have to begin with the end in mind. And in my agriculture classroom, that was absolutely the case. They started out from the beginning with, these are the careers that you possibly could go into and make an impact. And when I say make an impact, that's an extremely important thing to point out because I've found with my peers these days, we really do want to be successful in a career and we do want to make money, but we also want to have a sense of value in knowing that we are making a difference in the lives of others with the work that we're doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so to, to be presented from the very beginning with, this is a challenge that we are facing, and we can meet this challenge, and we can beat this challenge through these various careers, that automatically gave me a sense of purpose and value in everything that I did in the rest of my agriculture class. And I'm simply just a representative. This is something that happens across the country on a daily basis in every single one of those agriculture programs. We're confronted with, this is the challenge, and these are the careers that we have to meet that challenge. It truly is a program that is rigorous because this is a rigorous challenge. This is not something that is going to be easy to obtain. And it's going to take science. It's going to take mathematics. It's going to take those agricultural technical skills to meet that challenge on a daily basis. This is a true new ag-based economy. And we have to develop students who are college ready, but also that don't want to go into college that can meet these challenges. And so it all started in the classroom but it then transitioned into a supervised agricultural experience program. Uh, many of you who were former FFA members may be familiar with this, but this is our work-based learning component. Every student in every classroom is encouraged to have this supervised agricultural experience program that's shown on the screen. And it can look very different for every student. Some students will choose to do a placement supervised agricultural experience program where they're working on a local farm or in a local agribusiness or they can learn those business management skills from that entrepreneur. They can learn the technical knowledge that they'll need in their future career, whether they continue to work with that agribusiness or whether they continue to work with some other company. They're learning those skills right under a supervisor that is knowledgeable and ready to mentor them to be successful in future careers. But then there's also programs where students are entrepreneurs. That means that they own their project. That was what my particular supervised agricultural experience was. I can remember in my seventh and eighth grade agricultural education classes that I really became interested in swine production. It was something that was common in my local community and I thought that would be really interesting to get into. So I became somewhat passionate about it and I, I decided to start my supervised agricultural experience program. I started with two sows in the eighth grade. I, I looked up all the information and the technical knowledge that I would need to know to select the proper genetics to truly produce quality swine and quality feeder pigs uh, that would be the outcome. And so th those first couple of years, it was really kind of just getting in. I really didn't produce the quality livestock that I wanted to, but I was able to gain a little bit of money by selling those feeder pigs to local individuals who were showing in fairs in my community. But as I continued to set goals for my supervised agricultural experience program, as I continued to set a vision for what I would want that entrepreneurship or that supervised agricultural experience program to look like, as I continued through the program, I was able to meet those goals. I was able to, to reach that vision. In fact, by my senior year in high school, I had 20 sows. I was producing roughly 160 pigs in a year, and when I finished that project, and as I graduated high school, I moved off to college and I couldn't take care of the sows anymore. 
I actually had netted fourteen thousand dollars that I was able to put into a savings account and use towards a future education, all because I'd been engaged with knowledge that I had learned in the classroom, and I was able to apply that in a project that I was passionate about. And so if there's something that I would leave with this particular portion of work-based learning, something that I've noticed that I love about agricultural education, supervised agricultural experience programs, is there's such a broad array of programs. Students may be involved in an agricultural marketing or communications business where they're learning the skills that they'll need to go into sales and marketing once they reach the end of their FFA career. And then there are students who truly have large thousand acre production farms who are producing the food that is going straight to our plate on a daily basis. And so in the rest of our, our different programs, we have to continue to make sure that we're really widening that career pathway so students can be become engaged in various aspects of that pathway. Let's not narrow our focus to the point that students feel like we're pigeonholed. We've got to make sure that we connect to their passions in that pathway and allow them to explore that. That is the beauty of this supervised agricultural experience program. And that is where students have been able to connect those technical skills that we've learned in the classroom in middle school and high school to an actual real life business situation that we can use when we move forward. One final story on the supervised agricultural experience program. There was a gentleman that started an FFA and he was just, he started a small nursery and landscape business. In fact, he had a couple of plants and he had started looking into ways that he could possibly grow his business. And so through the FFA, he set various goals. He set uh, various marks that he wanted to meet throughout his program. Today, he owns a multi-million dollar nursery and landscape business because he got involved in this program. And it started because he and his advisor got together and said, what are we passionate about? And what could this look like in the future? It's supervised because we have mentors or advisors who are looking over that program on a daily basis. And I think that's something that we could certainly transition over into other career and technical education programs, is providing a mentor to look over these work-based learning experiences and provide them with goal setting and ways that we could continue to grow that work-based learning in the future. And so finally, the last thing that I was able to gain from my career pathway experience were those 21st century skills. And that's really where this blue jacket in the FFA organization comes in. Because it is truly focused on premier leadership, personal growth, and career success. And career success is the main focus. We want to make sure when those students get out of that agriculture classroom, once they finish that supervised agricultural experience program, they have the leadership skills that they can truly lead the agriculture industry and our communities in the future. And so we really focus on what are some different ways that we can accomplish this. We provide experiences, as we like to call them, where students are able to get engaged in service learning opportunities. They plan community events where they raise money for a local charity or they raise money for an individual in the community who's suffering. And then they use their agricultural knowledge to grow products and then uh, give those products and have them sold to raise that money for those individuals in the community who are struggling or who need that, that money. And so it's really a neat opportunity to provide students with, with a chance to get to lead. They take it on. It's student-led. And one story about that that really hit home with me is there was a young gentleman in the FFA, and we'll have to continue this conversation. I think we're having to wrap up according to Dr. Ferguson. <laughs> You know, I hate that uh, we didn't have the timer because that really was in the spirit of March Madness. <laughs> but thank you so much, and I would love to share more with you later. Note to self, never follow an extraordinary young person. Thank you, Clay. Note to self, never go in between two extraordinary young people. Hello. Um, I'm Sean Bowen, and I have the great pleasure of working at Europe. And um, just a quick overview for those of you who don't know about us. It's a year long. We're, we're in enterprises, and we're in our second decade. And our core program is a year long program that essentially takes low income young adults, 18 to 24, with a GED or a high school diploma, and takes them into a professional entry level career pathway job. And we spend six months in the classroom with them, teaching them professional and technical skills, preparing them for careers primarily in IT and financial operations. And they end up interning in one of our 250 plus, mostly Fortune 1000 companies, and get college credit during their time there. 
We're focused on what we call a high expectations and high support model. Our revenue model, 50% of it comes from the employer partners who make a contribution to the organization to have access to this pipeline of talent. That's our core program. We started a division last year to be experimenting with how to take the components of what we know is working for this dual customer model, both serving on the demand side, the employers, and on the supply side, the extraordinary young people, and seeing if we can essentially get similar outcomes with at a lower cost per outcome, working deeply embedded in community college and soon to be inside some companies. We're also involved in the systems change work that we've been talking about in the movement building and focused on, as I think Angela said earlier, the three Ps, perception change about who's talented in this country and perception of young people about what's possible for them, the practice changes needed in the employer community to really ensure that we're seeing the full range of human capital and the long, hard, painful P, the public policy that does, or I would argue does not currently effectively ensure that we have a human capital investment to ensure our 21st century competitiveness. So, without further ado, an extraordinary alum of here in Europe, Boston, Mohammed Zier, to tell you his story. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's such a lovely day in Boston, except the weather. <laughs> well, before I start, I prepared this to read to you, but guess what? I'm not going to do it. Because <laughs> my staff are coming from the heart, and they think and they believe that things that come from the heart will go to the heart. So my story began in 2009. I immigrated to the United States through the immigration lottery. I got my green card. March 26, I'm at Logan Airport, knowing nobody. Have 2,500 in my bank account, few words of English, and the public library. I started day one. Looking for roommates. I found a couple people who were students, college students. They accepted me uh, without any um, references or any uh, credit check. So I got in. I was commuting from Salem State to Boston every day, looking for a job. For about three to four months, finally I found a job at a coffee shop. So I started working 25 hours a week making eight dollars per hour, extremely happy. <laughs> Start getting paid in US dollar. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so I kept going a few months, six months, seven months, I'm happy making coffee. My customers like me, I, like I made friends. But one day I stopped and they said, this is not taking me anywhere. I work to pay for my rent and to pay for the tea pass, and to pay for my dinner and lunch, and get my coffee at my coffee shop, and no saving. Where I'm going, this is not taking me anywhere. So I start looking for a job, or go to school, because I believe that with no education, you cannot get a better job. I applied for a couple schools, none of them recognized me. One of them was honest to me, and they said, you have no resume, you have no work experience. You're not going anywhere. And they were right. If you look at my resume back that time, the structure of the resume is skills, work experience, education, reward, and recognitions. Skills, I have none. Work experience, coffee maker. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> this is true. Probably, I can make 500 cup of coffee a day. It's an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody would take it. <laughs> Education, I have a bachelor's degree in economics from Algeria. Nobody would, rec would recognize that. If degrees from Germany and France and Sweden are, are not recognized in the United States, you need to go through tests. How about a country in Africa? Nobody look, would look at it. Recognition, none. I stopped there. So I looked at myself and I said, I want to build life. I want to have a family. I want to buy a house. I want to be a human being. So the only thing I looked at is I got to go back home. At least I speak the language. People know me. I have a network. <laughs> I have a bachelor's degree. I can do something. I met a friend of mine. I told him my story. He said, why don't you go to Europe? He said, how old are you? I was 23. I was like, perfect, go to Europe, they will teach you, and they will pay you. 
fuzzy. <laughs> now, <laughs> how come? So, yeah, so I said, let's give it a shot. I went there, I applied, they rejected me. They said, you don't speak English well. After an exam, I took an exam. They said, go learn English and come back. I went to a community college, it's Bunker Hill Community College, people are aware of. I learned English for a couple of months, I went back, I applied, I got accepted. Extremely happy. No more working at a coffee shop. I had, <laughs> I had about 2,000 at my bank account that I saved. They pay me a stipend of 150 a month, you add them. I mean, a week, you add them, you make 600 a month. I was paying 500 for rent, a very small room. Tie top the belt and live day to day. From day one, I know that these people are not joke. From day one, they set the expectations. They get, every student starts with 200 points. If you're late from class, you lose 25. If you use your cell phone, you lose 25. If you sleep in the classroom, you lose 50. Extremely well governed. So, <laughs> there is no joke here. And the good thing is, if you meet all expectations, by the end of the week, you receive a 50 points extra. And by the end of the month, who, whoever had a, 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 the higher score, they would give him an award. That award would be a ticket to a Celtics game, a, a ticket to a movies, you know. So, they want to open our eyes to to know the meaning of working hard and have fun. That's how I look at it. Within six, within six weeks, I was able to build VBA macros in Excel, people who are familiar. I was able to read the Wall Street Journal and understand it. Basic concepts of finance, stock, bonds, complicated instruments, options, swaps, Everything. Within 12, 12 weeks, the first six weeks were in IT. And this, because I chose to go in finance field, that's what I, I have been learning. Not only that, a huge network. I had a mentor, he was a vice president at State Street. We were meeting every week. He was on me. This is right, this is not right. This is right, this is not right every two weeks. I had an advisor. I was talking to him about personal challenges in every day. I'm from a different culture. I came here in 2009. I have been here only for two years. Culture may shock me sometimes. So he was there. Perfect. So within this, the first six months, I built technical skills, education, network, Communication, and I was ready. Ready for what? F for my internship. They placed me in an internship at the Bank of New York Mellon. I was fully ready from day one. I went there within a week. No lie on this. Within a week, I learned all the systems. I go home, I take notes, go home, study them. Go back, looking forward to the next day. Go back, learn, take notes, go home, study them. My manager was extremely impressed. By the end of the internship, his comment was exceeding expectations. My coworkers were extremely happy about me. They said the professional level in you, it's a way up. My internship ended in, in 2011, December 2011. So my team, I was doing accounting and reporting for an institutional account. On, 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 the man, on, on the asset management side. So my internship ended, my team did not have a job opening. Fine, now I have a resume, I have a cover letter. <laughs> yeah, you don't hire me, it's good, it's all good. Have a strong resume, skills lined up, 18 college credits from Cambridge College, a year of education, skills, a Bloomberg terminal, experienced in the use of the Bloomberg terminal. I can write VBA macros. I can do a lot of stuff. <laughs> anyway, I got two awards, one from my, my company. It was, um, it was award for the employee who's uh, 
contribution added to the success of the company. I got about 500 bucks for that. Perfect. I got another one from Europe, about $500. It was for excellence. By the end of each year, Europe holds a, 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 a career fair for its students. I went there. My company was there, the Bank of New York Mellon. So with my resume, I talked to a couple people. I got job offer from three companies. I got one from State Street as a fund accountant. I got another one from Citizen Bank as a customer representative. And I got the third one from the same bank with a different team as a corporate, global corporate actions specialist. Let's, I give, let's give a, a warm hand to Mohammed for that. Thank you uh -huh. so much. Great. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Daryl Wright. I'm a Vice President for Knowledge and Career Development at uh, Youth Build USA. And uh, of course, it's very difficult to, uh, to follow the testimonies of uh, the two young adults who have uh, certainly given us a range of pathways from, uh, from sows to coffee to computers. Um, and now we are also going to move into the, uh, the world of construction plus in addition to uh, 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 construction. Uh, Youth Build uh, is a, uh, a national organization that is comprised of 273 uh, local uh, organizations that provide uh, a single program model that engages opportunity youth um, in the construction of affordable housing uh, with the opportunity to earn a GED, high school diploma, um, and an industry-recognized credential. Um, in addition, uh, this uh, six to 10-month uh, experience includes uh, counseling and case management, um, as well as uh, leadership development and uh, graduate follow-up uh, efforts uh, at the conclusion of the program. Uh, Youth Build uh, serves uh, approximately 10,000 young people per year and about 73% uh, are men, and 72% uh, are African American and Latino. So without uh, further ado, I want to introduce uh, a member of our National Alumni Council, and also a graduate of Youth Build uh, Providence in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Goma Wanle. I apologize if I seem a little nervous, but carpentry is really my skill. Public speaking is something I'm getting better at. <laughs> uh, youth Build, there's not much I can say about Youth Build, except it, it changed my life. I'm originally from uh, West Africa, Liberia. Uh, I came here when I was about eight and a half years old, uh, trying to fit in with the, the social aspect of being from a different country was difficult. I, my name is not a common name, so I got made fun of a lot. But uh, the biggest thing that happened to me as a child was losing my father at an early age. Uh, I lost my father when I came here, I was about eight and a half. I lost my father 11 months later. Uh, so that was real difficult. A lot of pressure was put on me from my mother's side because I was the oldest sibling. Uh, pressure to, be, to step up and be the man of the family. Pressure that I really wasn't willing to accept. I was more worried about playing sports, trying to fit on the social aspect, just trying to be a kid. Um, let's see, going to school, I, I was decent enough to do the bare minimum in school and, 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 and pass. Uh, the pressure that my mother put on me, later on I would learn that she was uh, applying tough love, but the way I reciprocated it was, this lady is never satisfied. <laughs> you know, no matter what I did was, you can do better, you can do more. How, if I got a B, it was how come you didn't get an A? If I came with an A, why you didn't get an A plus? So I got to a point where I just stopped applying myself. I stopped applying myself, I stopped really caring. I stopped really not thinking about my future and not knowing my value and just, I just went through life not really thinking about anything. There was really nothing important to me. Uh, I graduated high school, like I said, bare minimum. I, I now believe I think I'm a victim of social promotion. I was 18 my senior year of high school. I had D pluses and C minuses, and that was considered good enough to pass through high school. Knowing I wasn't prepared for college, I knew I wasn't really interested in going to college. Uh, 
My mother gave me the ultimatum, you're either in school, you get a job, or you're out my house. Well, I tried school. Let's try this, let's try college. <laughs> I, I tried CCR, I tried a community college of Rhode Island for a little bit, and flunked out because of, I majored in females. I was more interested, <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the best way I can put it, because I was more interested in, in looking at females, going to parties, than going to class, studying, taking tests. It wasn't, I couldn't find the connection between school and real <coughs> life. There wasn't that connection, like the classes we were taking didn't reciprocate what was going on in real life to me. So that disconnection was there. I flunked out of school, flunked out of CCRI, so it was like, okay, you either gotta get a job or you gotta get out the house. Uh, my last choice was Youthville. Uh, a friend of mine had told me about Youthville, and the biggest thing that really convinced me to go to Youthville was they gave a stipend. Every two weeks, I would receive $200, money that I didn't have now, so that was really good for me. I got to Youth Bill not knowing Youth Bill would really blow my mind. I got to Youth Bill in the small classroom settings allowed me to excel in class. The construction hands-on allowed me to recognize that I'm pretty good with my hands. The community service that we were forced to do, well, at the time forced to do, <laughs> it really gave me a sense of a good feeling, being able to go to these different organizations and help out and being able to building things in our community, things that to this day I still walk by and notice that my class did that project. Building houses that I know families that live in there and I can walk by those houses and be like, I helped build that house. So it gave me a sense of value. Uh, the staff were very, it was, it was more of a family orientated. I really felt that the staff members at Youth Bill really cared about my future. They encouraged me. Something that was lacking in my life. I was going through life you know, hearing, oh, you can do better, you can do better. Now I'm hearing, great job. Wow, you really did that, you can do this. And so it's kind of mind blowing. So when someone's telling me, great job, I'm looking around, talking to me, good, <laughs> good job to me. Out of, my, out of the graduating class, I was the only person selected to pursue uh, an apprenticeship with the Carpenters. Uh, throughout my apprenticeship, probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. Before, before joining my apprenticeship, I probably, no. I didn't know the difference between a flathead and a Phillips screwdriver. I kept wondering who Philip is and why do I need, and why do I need his screwdriver? <laughs> my, my apprenticeship, uh, I was faced with a lot of adversities. It was a new element. There was a little bit of prejudice. Uh, the, the environment that I grew up in, I was working with carpenters around the age of 45, 50 years old. I was 21 at the time, so what I was interested in wasn't what they were interested in. The same music that I listened to wasn't the music that they listened to. The way I spoke wasn't the way they, they couldn't understand me. It, it sounded like gibberish to them. So getting through all of that, I really wasn't passionate about construction, but because of the staff at Youth Bill had believed in me so much, I, had, I felt like I was obligated to finish this apprenticeship program and not quit on them because they, because they, they believed in me so much. I finished my apprenticeship. Throughout my apprenticeship, I recognized that I really wasn't passionate about building. I enjoyed the, the people aspect of it, but wasn't really passionate about building. Once I graduated Youth Bill, I was actually selected by my peers to serve on the National Alumni Council. Through this council, I was exposed to a lot of personal development personal development trainings. It was through these trainings that I recognized that I really do like training and wanted to be some form of a teacher. Lucky for me, my former youth bill graduate, Andrew Cortez, has started a program called Build the Futures, which is a low, which is a nonprofit, nonprofit program that is a pre-apprentice program that is designed to train low-income residents of Rhode Island in a career path in the commercial construction industry. Something that I just went through. An, pretty much a pre-apprenticeship to get guys into the apprenticeship program for, for, with the union trades. Uh, I started volunteering for him. He recognized that I had people skills and that I was, the, the participant was uh, coming, coming to me for guidance. They could see that, from what I was told was from participants, I made it believable because I looked like them, I spoke their language, so when I was conveying the information to them, it sounded real. It didn't sound like something somebody was making up to, to, to try to trick them in any way. So seeing, recognizing that I had interpersonal skills, he kept me on for a while. I started out as the assistant career, I started out as the assistant construction trainer. I am now the assistant career and training director. Uh, 
the biggest, the couple things that have really impacted me in my, and throughout this whole transition, there's a gentleman by the name of Alan Sean Feinstein, a philanthropist in Rhode Island, and he's had this saying that's in just about every high school, uh, the greatest achievement of all is to help another person achieve, and I think it's those words that's kind of continuing to move me to make sure I help other people. Well, we're gonna have to move on, unfortunately. One so, last, right, one last, one last statement. <laughs> I apologize, I must, I must leave you with these final words. It, in Youthville, we were given uh, a pledge that we had to say every morning, and I think I am only just living by the pledge that I committed to uh, in, in Youthville, and I'll share this pledge with you real quick, it's two seconds, if y'all please. Uh, it starts off, as a community, we are engaged in the united struggle to overcome the social, political, economic, educational, and spiritual inequities that threaten to destroy us as people. We recognize that as young people, we are the greatest resources available to the survival of our community. Therefore, I stand ready and willing and hereby pledge my commitment to rebuild and improve the quality of life in our community through collective work, responsibility, and cooperative economics. To educate, elevate, and raise the consciousness of ourselves and others along the way. To develop our potential as leaders and positive role models so we can proactively pursue justice, equality, and peace for all. All this we do with appreciation, love, dignity, respect, and faith that the collective will of the community is the greatest force conceivable. I'm just doing my part. And accepting the microphone and the time constraints that come with it <laughs> reminds me of the transition you make from being at work as a, as a school superintendent where every decision and recommendation is viewed as brilliance to going home and you haven't made a good recommendation in years. <laughs> Yeah. I, I address you as the superintendent with the challenge responsibility of introducing one of our graduates. Massachusetts has fo some 45,000 young people in its career tech education. But given the short opportunity to use the microphone, and as the former president of the State Superintendents Association and the former president of the State's Vocational Association, I want to take a moment to convey our appreciation for the leadership and the effective elocution of the former Secretary of Education, Paul Revel. Paul, great job. Since it's been years since I've had an opportunity to see him, I'd also like to, to use a moment to convey my appreciation to Colorado State colleague and a college classmate of mine, Rich Feller, who has pointed out so well and so effectively in everything he's done that career guidance counseling is part of the solution, not part of the problem. Rich, nice job everywhere. My official role is to introduce Deneen Kozlin, who I, that's the name in which I knew her, it's as a student, Tetral. <coughs> She's a 2006 graduate of our school system and the business technology program. She's an individual who continued to further her education following that, earning a bachelor's degree in English from Worcester State University, following a previous experience at the State College, State University of uh, Massachusetts. Uh, when she was formerly employed as a business office coordinator for area nursing home, she enjoyed success but d decided to transition for a smaller company, which I'm sure she'll make a comment on, where she could have a greater sense of pride and a role of growing and advancing that company. She has always worked part-time as a dance instructor and continues to do so. She has recently started her own marketing consulting business and has used the skills attained in high school and college to assist business with print, web, and social media marketing opportunities. At Blackstone Valley Tech, Although I knew Deneen from her success with Skills USA and her multiple roles in high visibility within our school system, she was a young lady who knocked at the door and said, I'm thinking of competing in a speech competition. I couldn't have been more delighted that she would seek my input. In fact, I encourage my colleagues to occasionally move from the multi-year activities of selling budgets and HR issues and so many others to spend a moment to take on a small task like the one I recall working with this young lady uh, so many years ago. In any case, she was viewed as most likely to succeed by her peers at Valley Tech and did particularly well in that speech competition. Denise, it was a pleasure to work with you and your family, and it's great to see you again. Thank you. Well, I think that about sums it up, so. <laughs> Um, my name is Deneen Tetro. Thank you. I would like to thank Dr. Fitzpatrick so much for inviting me to be with all of you today. Um, I come from a family of vocational education graduates, and um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my story about how I became the first one. Um, 
I was an eighth grade honor roll student. I was at dance class every single day following school, and I was an extremely bored little girl. I couldn't seem to dig my hands into enough stuff. And I just kind of fell into a rut. I wasn't engaged, I wasn't challenged, and school just was a chore for me at that point. And I was a girl who I wanted to read, I wanted more knowledge, I wanted, you know, give me everything you've got and I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna run with it. And so I remember very vividly actually the day that um, Valley Tech had come to my middle school and I was sitting in my auditorium seat and I'm, if I was a cartoon character, you would have seen that light bulb go off right above my head because I was watching the presentation. I said, this is it, this is my opportunity. I need to grasp this. At the time, um, we had always talked, my parents had always talked about my brother going to vocational education. Um, we had never discussed it for me. And, you know, there, unfortunately there was a stigma against it. My parents were like, well, you know, Denise, I just don't think that's an option. Well, I had gone home and I said, look, Dad, there's an open house, it's this time, this time, this day, and we have to be there. And we certainly went. Um, within 10 minutes of being there, I looked at my dad, I said, well, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not that shocked because I was, you know, his outspoken child. And um, I go, well, I have to go to Blackstone Valley Tech, Dad. And he, well, you know, and I go, no, really, I have to go. If I don't go, my grades will drop. I'll become very sad. I just, you know, I have to go here. It's just not an option. And I think he got sick of listening to me because it didn't take very long. And I was on my course. I was going to Blackstone Valley Tech. so. Um, I did get in, thank goodness, and I started what was some of the most formative years of my entire life, and I am so grateful to Blackstone Valley Tech because that was one of the most positive experiences that I've had in my young adult life. Um, I was an excellent student. I worked really hard. I was a part of every club. Um, I was not a part of the ski club because it turns out you have to like to ski and you like to go in snow and sneak cl ski club, so I was not a part of that. But um, I was involved in Skills USA. I was the state vice president for the Massachusetts chapter. Um, I had great opportunities with that. Um, I was able to go out into businesses with the other state officers and um, just learn about employability and learn about the workforce that I was going to be entering. And um, yeah, one of the most amazing things for me, anyways, I don't know how many people here are um, vocational education graduates, high school graduates, but yes, you're learning, you're being lectured, yes, you're learning from a text, but you have this amazing ability to sit in a classroom and take that knowledge and watch it come to life below your hands, in front of your eyes, and it was so empowering as a young adult. I, I just knew it, if I keep listening, if I kept learning, this was just the beginning for me. And it was, it was just the beginning. And I didn't see there, you know, a lot of the, from my sending school as well, you know, you're never gonna go to college now, so. And I said, well, that's certainly not true. I have every intention of going to college. And I did, and I was actually sharing a story with Dr. Fitzpatrick uh, before we came up here, and um, a friend of mine from my sending school, we both applied to UMass Amherst, and you know, of course it was, well, you went to a vocational school, probably not gonna get in. Of course, I didn't feel that way. I was like, well, of course I'm going to get in. But um, it actually turned out I did get in. And unfortunately for her, it did take her a little bit longer. She was actually a couple years into college before she was able to go to UMass. And I thought, you know, it's not true. You can do as much as you want with your education. And I have. I went to college. I was able to go through college with really minimal loans. I put myself through. I worked um, four part-time jobs, a couple of them which were in my trade. I was in business technology. And um, I came out with a bachelor's degree. And actually, my first job, I do not accredit to my bachelor's degree. I give complete and total credit to my high school education. Um, at Valley Tech, I had taken an employment class. Um, and we had gone through different scenarios for interviewing, for resumes, cover letters, follow up for interviews. And um, I had gone, I worked at a nursing home a large company and I went in and they were gracious enough to give me an interview. I, I had no real experience in the, in, in the nursing home industry and um, I sat down and they talked to me and I walked out of the interview and I said, you know, I gave a great interview but it's, I don't have any experience in this. this. They really need someone who has more to offer than I do. And I went home and I did what I learned in my 
employability class and I wrote a letter. I said thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. You know, I know I lack experience, but I promise you that I will make up for that with eagerness to learn. And I was successful. I got my job. And um, when I finally accepted, of course, it took like 10 seconds. I was like, of course I take the job. But, um, <laughs> you know. Um, and when I got there and I met with the executive director, he said, he goes, you know, I had people with more experience than you did. And I said, oh, I, well, thank you very much. I really genuinely appreciate you hiring me. He goes, well, it was the letter. And I said, thank you. Thank you so much, Valley Tech. Thank you. And it went from there. I was, pro oop, one all right, really quick. I was promoted eight months later, and I, run, I ran a 101-bed facility business office. And um, I recently got married and needed flexibility, and I was able to now go back and work um, in the field that I had gone to high school in. And I was trying to get my own marketing business up and running, still in the early development stages, but I am working for a company doing their marketing. And I still get to do what I love, and I teach dance as well. So I definitely feel as though I have, I've succeeded. I did what I sought. Wow, <laughs> definitely uh, very difficult to follow. Three very just inspirational, but uh, inspirational and powerful stories. Um, so my name is Christopher Prado, and the reason why I'm here before you today is that through the, the National Council of Young Leaders, but the reason I'm on the National Council of Young Leaders is because the opportunity that was provided to me to be on the National Council through Opportunity Nation, which Mark is the, the CEO of that organization. and so. A lot of the, the, the stories that were told um, talk about how um, these pathways of prosperity have been built um, through career CTE technical education. Um, my story is a little bit different. Uh, I went to high school, you know, I was a, I guess for some reason in third grade, um, I scored well on tests that I don't remember taking. Um, and since then, I've been on a, a trajectory towards opportunity. Um, and that's because I was allowed to go into a magnet program school. Um, allowed to, uh, you know, despite the fact that my, my father didn't even graduate from high school, despite the fact that I'm a first generation uh, Mexican American citizen and college graduate, I'm, a first gener I'm the first person to graduate from college in my family. And I think uh, what one of the most piercing points of whether you talk about CTE, career technical education, and um, going the traditional pathway that I did is it's, and somebody said it yesterday, but it's not a, a decision of or it's and in, um, it's, it's a decision of career and college pathways. And so that's how I was able to, to, to go to Cal State University East Bay um, to become the first person in my family to graduate from college. And so that's how I'm here today. Um, that's how I'm here today. And so one of the things that, one of the questions I know I've been asked is, you know, how do we, how do we reach out to the people that, that haven't been haven't been connected to opportunity like I was, like everybody on the panel is. How do we reach out to those people that maybe not fit the mold of traditional education that I took, or that is that was that that uh, they found um, answers to? And so one of the the things that I tell my sixth grade students in the after school program where I work is one way we can leverage um, one medium we can use to just educate and, and and open up doors for people is music. And so one quote that that really kind of epitomize the reason why we're all here today, um, the reasons why we're having this discussion about um, you know, creating pathways to opportunity um, is this, and it comes from a, a hip hop artist, and um, my students like him a lot, his name's Kanye West, and so in one of his songs he says, the system's broken, the schools are closed, the prisons are open, um, we've got nothing to lose, insert profanity, it's hip hop. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're rolling. And so we're rolling just a colloquialism to talk about, you know, we've got somewhere to go. I mean, so this talks about a lot of the reason why I think we're here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, because we're trying to figure out how do we leverage our own skill sets, how do we leverage the untapped potential we have in our country, um, in our cities that's trapped, and how do we unlock that potential? And so I found that music is a way that we can unlock that potential. And so that's the reason why I talk about Kanye West um, I'm also, I also listen to him, um, but, but yeah, and so music has very, been very effective in helping to, to expand the horizons of my sixth grade students um, in, cla in class. Another thing that I want to mention is that personally, uh, 
one opportunity that I did have that helped build my skill set was an internship through the, the Leon and Sylvia Panetta, Panetta, Panetta Institute for Public Policy, where I got to spend three months working in Washington, D.C. And it was, it's crazy because, because I come from a first generation, you know, a, a first generation Mexican American family. Nobody in my family, not even my older cousins, not even my parents have ever been to Washington, D.C. So connecting to opportunity, just the mere fact that I'm here at Harvard, just the mere fact that I was able to do that. Um, just kind of trailblaze, help to, to break through barriers, um, is, is just the far re removing those cognitive blocks about what is possible. And I know that's the, the reason about what we're here today is because we have, you know, different skill sets, different programs about what is possible, but how do we help individuals realize that and, and just trailblaze, once they realize this, then, then begin to trailblaze um, all of those barriers. And it was through that internship. Yeah, so it, it was through that internship that I kind of realized that, you know, um, I think Gomez said that he was fearful, like very uh, afraid or nervous, and you know, I was very afraid and nervous as well, but I think our deepest fear as, as a nation and just as people is, is not that we're inadequate, um, but that we are powerful, yes. powerful beyond measure. Yes. And so, thank you guys, I'm sure I'll have a chance to, to, to respond to some questions, but it's just been, it's just been a, really a blessing um, to be here before all of you. Okay, for various reasons, uh, we won't be able to take questions in the room, but I'm sure all of you in the hallway can respond to folks who want to come up and talk. Absolutely. Uh, we need to clear the room now. We've got 15 minutes uh, for break, then we'll come back in. So thank you. Thank you.